So welcome to the March 2021 uh, installment of the Northwest China Council's China Chat Series. Thanks for joining us. I'm Joe Liston, the president of the Northwest China Council. Helping coordinate and produce our event tonight is John Wong, the executive director of the Northwest China Council. Briefly, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Northwest China Council is a Portland, Oregon-based educational nonprofit formed in 1980 to promote greater cultural understanding between the US and China. We offer Mandarin Chinese lessons online, China chats and other virtual events as well. And as the pandemic starts to, to subside, uh, we'll return to a uh, more mix of virtual and in-person events. So keep your eyes open for those. To learn more about our organization and to keep track of the events we're involved with, visit us on the web at nwchina.org. You can also find links to register for future China chats and you can view recordings of previous China chats on the website as well. Before I introduce tonight's guest, I wanted to let you all know that there'll be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation tonight. If you would like to ask a question, please do so either in chat or I believe the QA function is available uh, for this event tonight. You can use that as well. Uh, and at the uh, QA session, I will moderate and read the questions um, off at that point. Tonight, we welcome Professor Joshua Goldstein. Dr. Goldstein is an associate professor at USC. He has a bachelor's from Brown University and a PhD in modern Chinese history from the University of California, San Diego. He also serves on the editorial boards of the Zhongguo Shueshu and the Chinese Historical Review. Tonight, he will talk about his book, Remains of the Everyday, which discusses the last century of recycling in China with a focus on what led up to the contemporary recycling and plastics pollution crisis brought on by China's ban on importing recycling that began in 2018. So with that, the floor is yours, Josh. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so hopefully I'll make this work sort of properly. Um, thanks for folks for showing up. Um, if it hadn't been, I, this is actually a really obscure topic and it hadn't been for the China ban on importing scrap and uh, plastic. Um, I can't imagine why anybody would have shown up tonight. So I thank everybody for, for even thinking about this topic because um, most people usually don't. Um, uh, it's uh, kind of a, a, a look at um, a field that probably most of you haven't heard of called discard studies that is an emerging um, area of, of research uh, kind of, you know, into global issues uh, regarding waste and, uh, and all of the attendant uh, issues involved with that uh, from pollution to public policy um, to environmental, uh, you know, issues of, of um, urban metabolism, all that kind of stuff. So um, the way I wanted to introduce the book, because it's a, it's a kind of, you know, it's a hundred year slog uh, through a changing system of waste and recycling uh, focused on Beijing, was to go to this website that I've put together related to the book, because one of the things about garbage oh, and waste and uh, recycling, especially when it's done in a massive way, is it's kind of oddly photogenic. Um, and I wasn't nearly able to get the, all the pictures that I took during my research and, and the historical pictures uh, into the book. And so I wanted to put together a website where I could kind of let people see some of that stuff and also uh, write some essays about things that you know the book was, wasn't able to hold. Um, so this is the front page of the, that website and what you're seeing here is uh, I couldn't, this is, I took this picture back in 20, 2006, I guess, or 2000, yeah, around 2006. And at the time I didn't really have a camera that could encompass this waste pile of, of used uh, imported waste wire. Um, and so I just took a bunch of pictures of it and then kind of stuck them all together to try to give a sense of how big the pile is. And it actually is bigger than what you can even see here, but this guy is uh, a way of getting a sense of the scale of this pyre of pile of waste wire that was gonna be uh, mostly hand stripped down so that the, the plastic was in one place and the metal went another and all of it could then be reprocessed for recycling. Um, and this is just one small tiny part of the huge uh, scrap importation that was going on in China uh, starting in the late 1990s and going on until the ban uh, started to be put in place in 2018. Um, 
So the book, though, is a much bigger overview of recycling in China with a focus on Beijing and goes back uh, to the early 20th century. So that's where I'm going to go now. So, um, so this is basically a, a page that has a lot of pictures from the book, and I'll, I'll walk through chapter by chapter. This first picture is uh, a much more contemporary one. This is, uh, I don't know if any of you have uh, seen, there's a, there's a filmmaker in China named Wang Jiulian. Uh, he's made two films about waste uh, that have been hugely influential in China. He's probably, you know, if any one person besides Xi Jinping was responsible for the ban on scrap imports, uh, you could probably point to Wang Jiuliang and his film uh, called uh, Su Liao Wang Guo, the, you know, uh, the plastic nation. Um, and uh, that was, this is a, a photo from his, a, a screenshot from his earlier film, which was a uh, La Ji Wei Cheng, a, a city surrounded by waste, besieged by waste, and he spent a year and a half or two on his moped, on his motorcycle, going all around Beijing and finding uh, illegal garbage dumps uh, and documented them, filmed them, photographed them. Um, it's a devastating film, and this too had an enormous influence on public policy uh, and trying to contain this, uh, the waste problems in Beijing. So he's a uh, you know, the, the most active um, artist and activist in China who's been working on this issue in the last uh, decade or two. Um, but the book starts much earlier. So the book starts uh, back in the fall of the Qing dynasty in the early 20th century. And looking at Beijing and the question that it starts with and, and kind of tries to follow through the entire book is, well, what does an urban metabolism look like from the perspective of recycling? You know, what, what comes into a city and what goes out of a city and what gets recycled within a city and where does the waste go once it's finished with? And um, if we go back to the early 20th century and look at a city like Beijing, there's a bunch of different small little industries that do this kind of stuff. So, you know, paper would come in and metal would come in and uh, all of those things would eventually, once they were used, be sorted out and maybe uh, recycled, reused in some ways. But the biggest industry by far that it was involved in recycling was poop, um, night soil. Um, huge amounts of food come into the city, obviously, for there's, you know, hundreds of thousands, you know, half a million people in Beijing, up to a million people, depending on the, the year uh, in the early 20th century. They all eat, they all poop, and the poop has to go somewhere, and we don't have a sewage system that takes it out. We don't have uh, indoor plumbing, we don't have toilets, um, so people have to cart that poop away, and the poop is then made, it's not just thrown away, right, it was made into fertilizer, and so, um, if we go back up to this picture here and we see the city is surrounded by waste dumps in the early 21st century, but if we drew a similar map of Beijing in the early uh, 20th century, in the late early 1900s, this circle of where all these waste dumps were, were uh, are now would be a circle of fields and these fields would be remarkably more fertile than almost all the other agricultural land in the country um, because these fields were fertilized with all of the poop from Beijing. And that made this area extremely productive. And that's true for every city in China, a big city in China in, you know, 17, 18, 1900s, the early 1900s, they have this ring around them of highly fertile fields from using night soil as fertilizer. So this night soil was the biggest recycling industry in Beijing. There were several thousand night soil porters like this person here, depicted here from a Qing Dynasty painting. Um, they would carry these wooden barrels on their back and a big scoop, uh, long handled scoop, so they could reach down into pits, put the poop on their back, carry it somewhere, then it would be carted off to the edge of the city, uh, made into fertilizer cakes and, and such things, and then sold to farmers in the surrounding area. Um, so the first chapter deals with this industry, uh, with its, uh, here's, a, here's a photo from the early 20th century of uh, one of the a young porter. Um, here's a picture of, of it, the alleyways that make it clear why you need people with barrels on their backs. There's almost very, you know, it's very difficult to get into these alleys that existed in the city with a, a court, horse and cart, et cetera, right? So the only way to do it was to have a, a porter like that get in there to get the poop out. Um, it was a uh, pretty interesting politically, uh, as, a, as an industry, the leaders of it were kind of gang leaders. They were 
pretty rough and tumble, um, pretty wealthy, exploited their, uh, the average worker pretty terribly, uh, abused them quite badly. The porters themselves were, uh, as you can expect, pretty looked down upon by everybody else in Beijing. Um, but they did have one form of really powerful leverage on everyone in Beijing, which is they could stop working for you. Um, and so you made sure that you kept them sort of happy because if they decided to stop collecting your poop, your life would get really miserable. Um, and they could use this leverage also against the Beijing political establishment, which whenever it tried to reform them, uh, they would resist that. And so the first chapter is about the kind of political back and forth between the city who's trying to modernize or at least uh, discipline this waste management system and get it to be less smelly and more organized and the uh, pushback that comes from the uh, night soil uh, collectors and their bosses or they're, they're, they're called uh, hegemons. Uh, shit hegemons actually is, is the translation of their of what they're called in Chinese um, mm -hmm. who who ran the industry um, but the so the big picture though is that this is an urban metabol uh, an urban rural relationship right where this the countryside supplies the city with food and the city actually supplies the countryside with an really crucial input of fertilizer to keep this cycle going right and it's using this waste um, so that it is actually very much an important uh, and it's a commodity, it's paid for, it's bought and sold, it's, it's got quite a little, lot of value. Chapter two looks at another, uh, uh, basically all these other aspects of recycling that in terms of scale were much smaller than the poop industry. Um, and this is a, a chart that, that somebody who back in the 1950s who worked in the industry kind of drew trying to represent what uh, the recycling and scrap world looked like in the early 20th century and all of these different types of people who collected things went to the market. Uh, these are night, night markets or dawn markets. They happen early in the in the morning when there's not very much light. That way you can also pass off not just uh, you know scrap but used goods, stolen goods, fake goods, all that kind of stuff. It's all rife in these kinds of markets. Um, and then sends it to all these other places to be sometimes to be used in, in, in small industries, especially handicraft. Beijing's handicraft uh, industries were often fed directly by, by the scrap that was collected. Um, so, and you know, so there's pictures here of you know, people at the garbage dump picking the good stuff out. Here's a picture of what they picked out with you know, paper and coal, et cetera. This would then, here's a collector who would rove the streets uh, exchanging usually matches for paper. And then this, uh, the metal scrap, et cetera, would end up at, at different shops to be made into vases. This is somebody who is uh, processing iron scrap uh, into molten iron that could be used to make tools. This was a sheet metal worker who made pails out of sheet metal. So looking, the chapter two looks at all of these different very small kind of scrap industries, but they're tied up with all kinds of handicraft, all kinds of reuse, um, and repurposing of things, right? These mops are also repurposed, right? This is rag, right? Somebody goes and collects rag and then they're like, oh, this rag can't be used. Uh, th this piece of clothing can't be fixed. We can't mend it, um, but it's too good to just pulp into paper right now. We can strip it and make it into rags for mops, right? So this is an, if you add up all these little things that are happening in Beijing, it's actually quite an enormous employment sector in a city that in the early 20th century was very poor, um, had very little modern industry. Um, and so there's, you know, if you add it all up, tens of thousands of people who are either collecting the scrap, reprocessing the scrap, uh, working in handicrafts, um, tin makers, or selling used goods on the street, because Beijing, of course, had been incredibly wealthy as, a, as the capital. There's all these, uh, uh, you know, down at the heels aristocracy who no longer have incomes, who are starting to sell all of their luxury goods on the street. Um, and so I also look at this as the reuse sector. Um, you know, so it's the reuse and, and recycling are all kind of intermingled in a hodgepodge in the early 20th century. That's the first chunk of the book. The second chunk of the book looks at the socialist era. When the Communist Party comes in, what do they do with this sector? Um, well, they try their best in the going again to the back to the, the night soil sector. They try their best to uh, reform it. They execute a bunch of the shit lords, the night soil hegemons. Um, they make it into a public sector um, and they try to keep recruiting people to do the work as they attempt to modernize the uh, infrastructure for dealing with human waste. Um, and the hope is to keep 
uh, composting it and making it into fertilizer and sending it out to the countryside. But there's also a huge pressure to make Beijing, especially because it's the capital of the country, more modern, less stinky. Um, and so these two, uh, these, these two ideals, these two goals are kind of at odds with each other. What, on the one hand, uh, keeping this metabolic cycle going where you have the city supplying the countryside with good fertilizer and the peasants in the surrounding Beijing really want that, um, at least at first. And the other desire of hygienic modernity, um, a clean modern city to appeal to foreigners and diplomats and show how China is modern. It ends up, of course, that the hygienic modernity uh, impetus ends up winning out uh, the, nobody wants to work in the sector if they can, so people abandoned it. Even though this man here, Xu Chuanzhang, is made into a labor hero, a model of the great worker of China who, de who sacrifices himself so that others can remain clean and stink free. Um, he's a great socialist hero for most of his career. Um, but uh, even despite the fact that everyone wants to come to Beijing and work at his side to show their, their great labor uh, support, um, the actual people who do the work really don't want to be doing it and they go back to the countryside if they get a chance. Um, there's also some other garbage uh, stuff to be discussed in this book, but basically Sir John Shang's story is, is fairly central to this chapter is because Sir John Shang had an unfortunate moment of shaking hands with Liu Xiaoqi, the, uh, the premier of, of China in 1957. Um, Liu Xiaoqi would have later be attacked by Mao Zedong during the Cultural Revolution. Um, and when that happens, Shi Chuanshang goes from being a model labor hero to being a turncoat revisionist um, and getting beaten up repeatedly at demonstrations and uh, probably died of, of brain uh, hemorrhaging and damage from those beatings. Um, so uh, he has a rise and, 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 and terrible fall uh, as, a, as a labor hero who handles night soil. Um, Chapters four and five deal with the other scrapped sectors, which become much more important in the industrializing Chinese uh, socialist era. Um, there's lots of posters to be gone over, propaganda work about uh, how you're supposed to give all your scrap to the scrap collector who uh, is going to then send it to be made into wonder indus wonderful industrial stuff. Um, posters about how to make sure you uh, can preserve and reuse your, your cardboard box, not recycle it, but reuse it because paper was still that valuable and cardboard was still seen as that valuable that you would actually uh, send it back to the original factory that it was used in so it could be repacked and reused over and over again rather than put down into pulp. And this uh, poster tells you exactly how much power you're saving by doing that. Um, and all these other posters about how to, you know, collecting scrap and why it, it does so much for, for industry. So I look a lot at the kind of, this is, chapters four and five are very much about the industrialization of the scrap industry. Um, which involves a really complicated bureaucracy of first separating uh, the hodgepodge of used goods and antiques and uh, pond clothing and all of that stuff from things like metal scrap, paper scrap, uh, and getting these going in different directions so that the uh, you know the the scrap that can be used for industry is going to industry, um, and the system is remarkably thorough. Uh, and every kind of waste is accounted for in industry and people in their households have pretty much an outlet by which they can sell because the, the um, recycling offices in the cities buy scrap. They don't just have you donate it. They actually buy scrap at different prices depending on the kinds, you know, if it's paper scrap, if it's books, if it's newspaper, if it's different kinds of metal, all of those have different prices attached to them. Um, so uh, there's, there's uh, that whole system gets put together. Uh, by far the most famous moment, probably that some of you know about for, for scrap uh, in Chinese, modern Chinese history would be the backyard steel industry moment, right? In the Great Leap Forward where people are being told to take all of their, uh, their pails and their walks and all of the different metal that they have in their houses and donate it to these failed steel furnaces that are being thrown up throughout the countryside. Uh, to be melted down into what ended up to be pretty much useless iron slag that then had to go through a whole reprocessing that took, you know, another several years and it was just a hugely wasteful, uh, you know, enterprise. Um, uh, 
is that and and the, you know I also touch on that uh, enterprise a bit and its failure. Um, so that's the first couple of parts of the book, and then the third part of the book is probably the part that we most folks would be interested in more and want to talk about more. Though I'm happy to talk about any of the other stuff and its significance to the present because I do think it is significant to the present in various ways, um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that. Um, but. I don't want to babble this whole time. You guys hopefully have like something like a glass of wine or something to, you know, to keep you um, from, uh, you know, getting too bored. And I'll go through this last part. Uh, the last part is the post, uh, post Mao era reform era, when there is basically a huge explosion of consumerism in China, right? Socialism gave you industrialization without consumerism pretty much, um, which is an interesting situation to have because, you know, it's very, it's somewhat different from capitalism where industrialization is very much part linked to consumption, which then of course creates a huge waste stream, right? So we're very familiar with a kind of Western history of once industrial manufacturing happens and people start consuming more, then pretty soon we're gonna need landfills um, and a whole waste management infrastructure to go with it, right? And once you have landfills, then you invent disposability, right? Industries, <laughs> capitalists are, are smart and product, you know, people producing goods and selling them are very intelligent. They realize, oh, now that there's a garbage can that everything can go in, I can produce things for that garbage can. Hey, that means I can produce, you know, 40 razors that you'll use over the year because, you know, you'll, you dispose of the razor after you use it twice. Um, I, you know, so you, you invent disposability once you have landfills to dispose in. Um, that wasn't really what socialism built uh, as an industrial model, but post-reform, that is what gets built. And China has to keep up very, catch up to that very quickly. And in the 1980s and early 90s, it had not done so. Um, the bureaucracy was falling behind. And so you got these big waste dumps outside the cities. I took this photograph outside of Tianjin on the train and people were living on this waste pile and feeding pigs on it because you know it was no longer good for fertilizer. That whole process had been completely ruined by plastic and all these other things being thrown in the garbage. Um, but there was enough food waste in there that you could feed pigs on it. So this became a common thing to do. Um, I also, this is a, a, a landfill um, outside of Beijing in about 1999. Um, and, uh, you know, the, through the official entrance, of course, you, you, people were not supposed to go in, uh, but th the locals, uh, nearby had opened up a hole in the wall, um, and there were, you know, tens of people every day, maybe more than that, uh, that would go in and out of this, pick, you know, picking stuff out of the garbage to be reused and recycled, and, uh, um, many of these people were also from other parts of China coming in from Sichuan, et cetera, uh, in the countryside to do this, uh, this garbage picking. Um, in the midst of all of this uh, huge new prosperity and consumption in the city, uh, there were a couple of different ways to make a living as a recycler. Um, there, there was the state-run industry that was trying to make money off of it, but the state-run industry was never really oriented to dealing with all of the new sites of consumption that popped up throughout the city once the markets opened up, right? So um, the state industry of recycling had a good connection with all the other state run enterprises that had scrap to that they, you know, that produced scrap. So if there was a metal shop or whatever, of course, the state run industry had a good connection with them. But if, uh, you know, a, a new noodle shop opened up or a new, uh, any, any north, new supermarket would ever open up on the street, they had no connection with them and the people that ran in to take care of that scrap were uh, migrant recyclers from the countryside. Um, and they worked for almost nothing. Uh, they paid for the scrap just like the people from, uh, from the city did. So they bought everything from, from shop owners and from residents um, and they put in huge amounts of labor to cart it around and take it to places where it could be sorted and then eventually reprocessed. The main way that they would get around was on these three wheel carts. Um, Often as the city expanded going five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 20, even 20 kilometers to get to the edge of the city where their markets would be, where they would then sort everything. Um, this was what informal markets looked like back in the old in the, in the 1990s and early 2000s, but especially the 1990s. Um, I can go into why these informal markets looked so uh, horrible at the time. Basically, it was because the government chased these people around so much that there was no reason for them to spend any money on infrastructure. So they just worked in the worst possible conditions because otherwise to invest any money to make this uh, better when the government was going to come and shut you down the next day would have been foolish. Um, 
when the government stopped shutting folks down, they started building markets much more order, orderly like this one. This market actually was owned by the same person who owned this market. Um, this, this was just so far outside the city that he knew that it would last for a few years. And so he could actually build it in a way that was more humane to the people working there. Um, uh, so by the late 1990s, folks in the cities throughout China and Beijing just being one example, migrant farm migrant peasants migrants from the countryside had come into the cities had taken over entirely the recycling sector of every city um in beijing by this time there were a hundred thousand of them uh at the, at the height there'd be probably 200 to 250,000 migrant recyclers who went from the street level of collecting everything to running markets like this to packing uh loads on trucks to shipping it out to doing uh reprocessing and making uh material you know making goods out of recycled materials it was a billion dollar multi-billion dollar business in every big city in china entirely migrant done entirely informal the government entirely denied that it was actually happening and pretended that it wasn't um if it wasn't actually cracking down on everybody um chapter seven looks at what happened to this whole industry during the olympics um uh, this is a bunch of migrants trying to get their household registration permits extended so they could stay through the Olympics. Um, but there was a crackdown, obviously, on informal recyclers. They tried to keep them out of sight because they thought they were a, an embarrassment, um, which I think was a big mistake because, of course, I think most foreigners would have been like, oh, wow, this is an amazing process that these people do, and it's, it's great that they're doing it. But uh, the Chinese government thought that it was embarrassing that it was all done by informal migrants instead of by their themselves. The government actually pretended that they were do doing it um, and put on a whole show as if they were doing the recycling themselves, but they were not really. Um, anyway, this is uh, more pictures of that, of what's going on with the uh, recycling markets in the early 2000s. The government stopped cracking down on them so much, so they became much bigger, much more organized. This is an aerial shot of just one market with multiple stalls collecting all kinds of different stuff. Um, people are using trucks now to get the materials out to the outskirts of the city because the city's gotten so big it's hard to cart it all on on bikes so half the people are bringing in bikes half the people are trucking stuff in if you work in a one of these uh markets you basically live in a little shack in your stall um maybe one to two rooms uh so this is a picture of, of what it's like to you know what, what the housing is like when you are a migrant broker working in a recycling stall then there's the other big problem that starts to arise with all of this, which is, of course, you know, collecting scrap in the city is not that damaging. There's not a big environmental footprint. Reprocessing scrap can be really damaging. Um, and so the after everything was gathered together, it would be trucked off to more rural areas outside the urban air, you know, center where processing would happen. And again, this Beijing is not alone in this. Other cities in China all had this, were, were kind of ringed uh, by some processing centers. Um, one of the big ones outside of uh, Beijing and Tianjin was Ziya. That's where waste wire went. Um, and the way people dealt with waste wire was they hand stripped it, right? And plastic would go one pile, uh, even though it's covered with PCBs and other stuff, you would still reprocess that if you could. Uh, copper, the really valuable part, went in the other pile. But then when you got to super fines, these wires that were too thin to strip, what do you do with them? Well, you burn them, right? Um, and that's incredibly toxic. Uh, people would do it at night. You can see the burn marks all over the ground in this yard. Um, so the, you know, and this is, you know, if you actually strip the wire, this is what you get, right? So this is a truck full of that kind of plastic stripping. Um, but trying to control this burning was something the government got very involved in in the early 2000s, building um, industrial parks that were supposed to handle this problem. That's what that picture, the first picture I showed you was a pile at one of those industrial parks um, where burning was banned. Um, Another uh, thing that had to be dealt with was plastics that were collected. This is uh, plastics from Kentucky Fried Chickens, probably Tianjin and Beijing Kentucky Fried Chickens. Uh, this picture was taken in Wenan, which was the plastic, North China's plastic scrap capital, processing capital. Um, it probably was one of two or three at the most, uh, but maybe even the biggest waste plastic uh, markets on the, in China, which basically means the biggest waste plastic market on the planet uh, in the early 2000s. 
uh, an estimated 10 to 15,000 shops dealing with uh, plastic reprocessing. Um, so this gets at the, the, the problem we have today, right? Um, as you guys all know, most plastic these days that's getting collected in your recycling is not going to be reprocessed. Well, back in 2007 and 2008, when stuff was going to win on, um, that wasn't the case. Most of the plastic was going to get reprocessed because that market was so huge and diverse that they processed pretty much every type of resin. Now, they didn't do it in a nice way. It was extreme. Oh, dear. Uh, that was a mistake. Sorry. I hope I don't screw this up. Let me see if I can get back to the... Um, okay. Um, hope I can get back to the bright picture. Dear, dear. Oh, dear. I'm going to get into... A, I don't know how to get out of this properly. So I'm going to go back to here. I'm so sorry. Um, the... Um, Wenan was an incredibly, horribly polluted place. Um, and I'll just see if I can get to that picture now. Um, This was the market it went on, but you can't see it. We got there too late to get a picture of when it's really bustling and crazy, but stuff would come all the way in from Urumluchi. Um, and of course, stuff by the early 2000s, stuff was coming in through ports, uh, the Tianjin port, and maybe 40 to 50% of what was being bought and sold in this market was foreign scrap and not just domestic, but they all came together and went on. It wasn't, so when you read about, you know, oh, plastic processing is, all foreign material or whatever, that's just not true. Um, in most cases, there's a whole bunch of domestic material too. Um, this is just pictures of people doing all that processing. This is actually very, you know, this is this is a lot of fruit crates, pretty clean stuff. Uh, this is the most toxic part of the whole thing, which is when you melt the plastic and this guy is here working with no fume protection at all. He's just got a face full of melting plastic fumes and it's just a, it's horribly toxic. People in went on pretty much had, there was an epidemic of, of blood pressure problems, um, stroke-like symptoms, uh, failed livers. Um, rumors were that they, that the military had been unable to recruit anybody, uh, in the whole county for years because nobody passed the fitness test. Um, the virtual, uh, product was pellet, really good pellet, lots of different kinds of pellet for re recycling. I mean, it's, it's a very, uh, some of this stuff was very high quality going into cell phones, et cetera. Um, some of it was low quality and terrible. And some of it was like, you know, put into food uh, packaging that was would, should never have been used that way. Um, and this is what the river uh, that went through went on, uh, Jiago Zhuang looks like, or looked like then, it's, it's you know been cleaned up to some extent now. So this is what the government was so upset about, or at least this is what the government claims to be the main motivator behind its uh, ban on importing plastics. Um, I would argue that that's not entirely the, the whole story. Um, and I'm happy to explain why. Uh, in the Q&A. Um, and of course, the Olympics gave the government's uh, uh, basically failed recycling system a chance to, to take over for a little while and clean itself up. And it gave the government an excuse to bulldoze what were informal migrant recycling markets. This had been a market that had 100 plus stalls in it that was bulldozed during the Olympics. The people who ran it were uh, basically held by the police for three days until they signed papers to allow its demolition. Um, uh, and the last chapter is basically the ending of, of this whole system. This system had become not only uh, taking care of China's recycling to the tune of, say, you know, pretty much everything that was recyclable in China's urban waste was getting picked out and recycled effect effectively by the informal sector up through the, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012. Uh, and then Xi Jinping started to crack down not only on the informal recyclers in the cities, but especially on the imported scrap that was coming in uh, in the you know tens of hundreds of millions of ton tons a year, um, and initiated the ban. This is a uh, looking at some e-waste, so-called e-waste, which as you will see, right? This is basically it's not waste. These are all being sold as used uh, air conditioners. Uh, these are used TVs sold at a used TV market, but all of this is labeled, uh, dubbed e-waste by uh, not just the Chinese government, but by the Basel Accord and Basel Conference. We can talk about that. Um, I'm happy to give you a critique of my critique of that. Um, 
So if the chapter talks a little bit about the uh, used electronics and uh, discarded electronics system, um, uh, and also about the exportation of the plastic recycling system outside of China to places like the Philippines. This was actually a Chinese government supported organization for plastic recycling, putting an ad to tell Chinese uh, plastic processors, right, the very people that were cracked down on and went on by the government, telling them, hey, we're going to take you on a tour to go ch check out the Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia because you should open up shop there instead of where you, what you just do, opening up shop here. Um, so this is kind of getting at the two-faced nature of this uh, recycling ban that China is doing. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit of forms of hypocrisy going on here. Um, and the other thing about chapter eight is that, you know, what we pay attention to uh, abroad is this crackdown on and banning of the importation of waste, but actually there's a, a something going on in China that's just as big, that's very much the bookend of this ban, which is uh, a, a movement, a campaign to get people in the cities to sort their waste appropriately into four different categories. This has been rolled out. Uh, with Xi Jinping's support and with possible fines in every big city in China at this point. Um, and it's basically an attempt to give, to, to, to retake the waste sector uh, and the recycling sector away from the informal migrants and take and the, have the government state-owned enterprises take it over. Um, and that is what I would say is actually maybe the biggest uh, force behind the ban and all of these reforms is the desire of the government's part to uh, finally control this sector um, and take it from the millions of migrants because if you add it all up there's at least three to five million migrants just involved in the in the scrap sector alone that were, are being pushed out of that sector by the government now that's taking it over. Um, so that's pretty much it. The, the book ends with my this this photographer that I think is incredible, who took uh, really moving pictures of uh, people working at these scrap markets in Beijing, the migrants who work there, and then after all those markets have been demolished, uh, going back to those markets and kind of remembering them because the whole history of these people's work and labor to keep the city clean and do all this recycling has been expunged by the city. Um, and from historical memory and his, his photo photographs really capture that, their story. Uh, and in many ways, I just wish that my book could do justice to, to the, that story as well as his pictures do. So that's the book. Um, and I'm it's really be happy to, to talk more about questions about what's going on with the ban, et cetera, if people want to. Yeah, let's see. Um, am I back? I am back. Yeah, uh, that's fascinating. But look, before we start, I have a question for you. So has Xi Jinping been successful in getting people to send their recycling off to the Philippines or to other places? Okay, so Xi Jinping's goal, so, so a couple of, he, he wasn't wanting to do that. He, wa he wasn't, I don't think he was behind the government's uh, promoting the kind of exporting of the processing industry. I think that was... Um, probably lower level people that just let it happen. Um, but um, what Xi Jinping's most interested in, I think, has been uh, stopping the importation of scrap um, uh, and the pollution that comes along with it, but also um, uh, you know, the, the, economic, the kind of systemic economic upgrade that is imagined might come from stopping the importation of scrap because it's, it's very much part of the whole transition that China is supposed to have to leave being a, a, a low scale, man, a kind of low quality manufacturing country to a higher quality value added, uh, you know, uh, creator country, right? And so got to leave these kind of low level industries. And I think that's part of, that's, that's a main part of, of what this ban is about as well. Um, the other thing that Xi Jinping is very strongly behind is getting people to sort their waste in the city, to follow the proper guidelines. So you put the recyclables here and the wet waste there and the dry waste here and the hazardous waste there. And um, if you don't do it properly, you're going to get fined. And to get that whole system operating has been a huge, uh, he was hugely behind that. And, you know, in the summer of 20, I guess it was 2019 when that was really getting rolled out. 
uh, in Shanghai, it was probably the biggest news item in China in 2019, and certainly in Shanghai, nobody you couldn't you couldn't talk to anybody for two minutes without talking about waste sorting. Um, Laji Fun Lei. Uh, so he's very much behind that. It is, I think, in some cities has been somewhat successful so far, but I guess that you know it gets into the technicalities of what do you want, what are you measuring for success? What are you trying to, why, why are they even trying to do it? What are the goals here, um, et cetera? So I'd have, be happy to, to go into that if people want to. Yeah, we've had some questions come in, so we'll go ahead and get started here. So the first, there's actually, I think, a couple of questions from Michael Bloom. Copper prices are at a worldwide 10-year high. Is China likely to resume scrap imports of copper? And what is China doing about recycling motors to extract rare earth elements like neo, neo, all right, neodymium? <laughs> wow. Okay, um, Michael, I wish I was up on that at this moment, but unfortunately, I am not. Especially not on the rare earth stuff. I would imagine, however, they are. Uh, pretty intently up trying to do that kind of extraction because it's very much part of what their vision is of urban mining um, and uh, you know the having having that that the rare earths especially being being a big part of that um, I you know the man to ask your questions to would be Adam Minter because he's really the one with the with the ear to the actual in industry p folks in the uh, and the ministries. Um, my guess is that China is not going to be interested in importing copper all that soon, right? I think their um, their vision of what they want to be doing is being internally self-sufficient in terms of how scrap is, you know, how, how old materials are, are uh, brought offline and then reused uh, within the country itself. And that they're not gonna, that they're gonna, they see themselves as trying to build their uh, sufficient uh, materials base you know, within their own infrastructures to do that. And, and that's very much part of the, the timing of the ban, right? I mean, you could go back to 2003 and 2004 and read reports from folks who are starting to put together import industrial parks. And they're saying really clearly, like, we're doing this because we have a deficit and not enough of this stuff is being produced every year at home. And so we need to import it until we have uh, an infrastructure that does go to scrap at the proper rate so that our scrap turnover is high enough that we don't need to import it anymore. Um, and that's basically, and they pretty much predicted that will be happening around 2015, 2016. And pretty much that's where they're at. So, um, Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to jump to the chat. Uh, uh -huh. David McCall asks, uh, talk a little about the Basel Accord, specifically your opinion whether it would work if the U.S. were to sign on and adhere to its principles, trying to deal with our own hazardous waste rather than exporting all of our crap to developing countries. <laughs> Great. Okay, so there's various parts of the Basel Accord. Um, the e-waste part, is I think it is just really problematic. I think it was a terrible idea. I think the evidence they had for it was false, you know, pretty much. I mean, I can, I can point you to, to sources about that, but I would say, uh, go look for the name Josh Lepowski. Uh, I think I, I co-wrote with him and some other people called Criminal Negligence. Um, but Lepowski is really the researcher who's done the, the most work on this. I mean, basically, you know, Jim Puckett had one conversation with one uh, recycler in 2001 who told him that 90%, 80% of our stuff is going to China. He wrote it down in a report, used it as the basis of everything they wrote in that report, and everybody's copied that figure ever since for over a decade, and it became treated as if it was a fact. It was completely false. There was no evidence that it was just made up numbers this guy had pulled out. And it was so striking and bewildering that people were like, well, that's going to be a great headline. Um, when we, we've never been able to do a, anything like a full, uh, fairly comprehensive look in the US because of various disinterest and the, the way our government works around these things. But the EU did a really comprehensive study. And what they found was that at the very most, 15% of discarded electronics are going abroad. Um, and almost all of it is working 
It's not, you don't even have to repair it to have it work. So it's not waste, it's just used electronics. Um, and so what the Basel Accord did with so-called e-waste was that it criminalized the trade basically in used appliances and used electronics. The only person who's been thrown in prison for it, uh, you know, was a guy named Joe Benson, an African who was selling, you know, refrigerators and uh, cars to be re, <laughs> to be resold, you know, fixed and resold. Um, so it's been, and it doesn't, and, and, and the other problem was that it didn't achieve what it's supposed to achieve. Like, what is the goal here, right? If the goal of the, of, of trying to deal with e-waste was to make less of it, to create less toxic flows and handle those toxic flows properly, well then the Basel Conference did not achieve that with any of its e-waste laws at this point, right? Um, because e-waste still, at least for a decade, still moved around in huge amounts, you know, because used goods are valuable and people want them uh, in markets that are willing to pay, you know, for, for used stuff, right? Um, and it hasn't stopped the creation of kind of planned obsolescence for all kinds of appliances, the down, you know, the fact that, that things have to be basically thrown out because they can't be fixed, that, you know, outfits like Apple try to forbid people from reusing components, uh, make their devices almost impossible to take apart to stop people from repairing and recycling, um, create laws to, to almost forbid repair, right? I mean, there's a whole movement to, to make repair legal, right? So the Basel Conference did nothing to fix these problems, um, but it did make it really hard if you're in, in Egypt to get a, CR, a used CRT to use as a monitor to have your computer, right? So um, I'd say that was really, and it was based on terrible research and mis misinformation and continues to be, right? You can still find news articles. I have a bunch on my, I'm putting together a whole essay on my website, but you can find these anywhere. If, you know, someone goes to Abab Gloshi and says, this is the biggest e-waste uh, market on the planet. And it's just like anyone who knows anything about e-waste or looks at, it's like, it's not even an e-waste market, it's a used car market and it's really small, but it is horrible. I mean, it's like, yes, it's toxic and terrible, but it's like the biggest e-waste market in the world. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, plastic is a different story. The new ban that's being put on plastic, I would say, maybe makes some sense. Again, the same person is in charge of the publicity right now, which is Jim Puckett, who I have no trust for, um, because what he did around e-waste and what he did to attack Josh Lepowski when Josh Lepowski criticized him as a scholar, saying your data is falsified. Um, but um, when it comes to the plastic ban that's been put in recently, uh, I think it might be purposeful and purposeful only because it's putting pressure and creating a, a, a possibility to put pressure not at the bottom of the industry of recycling, but at the top of the industry of production, right? Which is what the e-waste law failed to do, right? But maybe this ban on plastic will help us do it. But the problem with the Basel Accord and Basel Conference here as well is that it doesn't criminalize the people that make the plastic, it criminalizes the recyclers. The recyclers are at the bottom of this economic food chain. And if anything, yeah, they yes, when they do their processing, it creates local pollution and that's really horrible. And the people get, who get damaged most are the workers there and the local residents. And that's, that's really terrible. Um, on the other hand, it's like, it's, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what the oil industry and the packaging industry is doing. And it's also fairly distorting to say that the scrap that's going abroad to be reprocessed is the only contributor to the pollution that's happening, right? All of these countries, the Philippines, China, Indonesia, they have their own consumer systems with enormous amounts of plastic waste in them. And that plastic waste is also going exactly through the same processes, ending up in the oceans, not being collected because the waste management sucks. So it's, it, there's, there's a certain kind of distraction that's happening with the Basel Conference to be focused so much on the recycling industry. Um, but I support it because I really hope that the attention that it's getting is going to get us to put pressure where it has to be if we want to change this, which is we have to stop making a lot of the plastic stuff we make. We have to stop the single use stuff. We have to stop letting oil companies open new plastic refineries, which they're online to do in the you know billions of tons worth over the next few years. Um, 
it's that's where they're going to start moving fossil fuels because they know they can't keep burning them and selling them uh, in the future because of climate change. So that's where we need to really focus, I think. We've had uh, several more questions come in. Uh, next one's from Edward Knightley. With the emergence of new recycling technologies and policy, do you think the current ban may be lifted or may, yeah. Um, well, so the, the ban is kind of, um, it's a word game on a certain level, right? Waste is what you call, <laughs> waste is only what you call waste, right? Up until four years ago, China was not the world's garbage dump, according to the Chinese government. China was importing, <laughs> China was issuing import permits for scrap in the millions of tons, right? Um, it was an input. Uh, at a certain point, you decide that you're going to call this input waste and garbage instead of scrap plastic pairings. Um, so the same game is happening with the ban. In theory, the government could at any time declare that a specific product that is called right now waste and not something that the government wants is now being cleaned up enough to spec and is important enough as an input that it is no longer waste, but it is an important industrial input and will rebrand it as not waste, not garbage, right? So um, do I think that's gonna happen with most parts of this, the possible scrap stream? No, I don't, I think for the time being, uh, for the foreseeable future, I don't think the government's gonna roll this stuff back. I think it is really, desperately trying to get as much state managed control over the sector domestically as it possibly can. I don't think it's really gotten anywhere close to doing that yet. Um, and so I think once it manages that, then it might say, oh, well, you know, global trade is profitable for us. Um, but right now I think it's like global trade will just mean more kind of profit going to people that aren't us. <laughs> so we don't want it. Uh, Mike R asks, uh, USA sent metal to China for years. This has been curtailed. Does Dr. Goldstein expect this to resume? What would trigger that? Um, yeah, I, it would, I think it's probably, it's again, it's probably, a, it's a sector by sector issue. I don't think it's going to be a blanket opening up to metals. Um, so I think what would trigger it would be specific industries having specific needs and pressuring the government on a specific item that they really want. I think for the time being with Xi Jinping in power, with this being a kind of, you know, something that he's clearly, you know, just by the people asking that you guys are here asking these questions, uh, which are very knowledgeable, thoughtful questions, right? It's, it shows that Xi Jinping has had global influence with this move, right? That, that putting this band together has got him global attention for his environmental move. Um, and I don't think that he's going to want to see that weakened anytime soon. Um, I know that recently there was some kind of uh, symbolic opening to a certain metal. I'm not even remembering what it was a couple of months ago, just to show that, you know, we can do this if we want to um, for, a, for uh, you know, some a specific quantity of a kind of scrap. But um, I don't think that it's going to happen in a large way uh, that I can that that I that I know of anytime soon. Um, you know, people who follow specific industries might have a, a clear idea of like, oh, this this metal is is going to be crucial, and they're going to open it up. But I I'm, I'm I wouldn't know. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, another question. This is a good one from Joanne Wakeland. Is anything working well in the Chinese waste stream? Um. Well, I mean, the, sor the, the, the sorting that's happening in the cities is certainly more effective now than it ever has been. Um, the, the last 20 years of so-called recycling was really, you know, by, 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 well, sorting by people in the city was non-existent. The recycling system was extremely effective because the migrants basically did it, but it, it took all the work out of it for, for urbanites. Um, so you do have urbanites more engaged in sorting their waste than they were. Um, it remains to be seen whether, how effective this can be. I mean, certainly by stopping the scrap from abroad coming in, China itself is uh, has a lighter pollution load in processing than it had before. Um, so that's been helpful. Uh, 
it certainly has driven a lot of uh, informal sector processes out of processors out of business. So that's you know it's definitely been effective in doing that. Um, so in terms of how they deal with their waste, the the big question of like you know reducing their urban waste, for example, no, they have not really gotten anywhere with that. People are are highly consumed. You know the, the consumption is is continuing to grow. Uh, you've probably heard of all about why my um, right people bringing in takeout food and all of the waste that goes along with that. Um, so there's a there's a kind of packaging explosion happening and waste explosion there. And the way that China is dealing with it is incinerators, um, which are and that that's that one again remains to be seen. Right. We know that incinerators up till now have been horribly managed and have been highly polluting. Um, one of the real, uh, the, the actual reason I would say for the waste sorting that China is doing, um, to say that it's for recycling is complete BS because China had the best recycling system. These microbes ran the best recycling system in the world. Um, you know, it was incredibly efficient and everything was recycled. What they're doing it for is to separate wet waste from dry waste, right? Because wet waste doesn't burn. It's hard to light a watermelon on fire. Right. Um, so you need to separate the wet waste from the dry waste if you want to have your incinerator burn at safe temperatures. And what I'm hoping is that if something good is going to come out of it, it will be that incinerators, even though I'm not a fan of incinerators on any level, but at least if they're going with incinerators, they should work properly. <laughs> and if they can get the wet waste out of those incinerators so they burn at high enough temperatures so they don't create dioxin plumes and, and really damage people's lives quite as badly, that would be a win, um, in its where in a in a weird way. Um, there's there you know the, the the last thing would be, in theory, when you get source separation happening like they're doing, you can really start to understand your waste. And if you really understand your waste, you can understand how to fix the pr production side. It's like oh, this stuff always goes to garbage, so we should stop making it. This stuff is recyclable, so she would we can do this with it. So if they actually keep studying their waste and coming up with good policies around how to reduce it, that would be another win. But again, that remains to be seen if they, they're actually going to do that. Uh, well, it's the top of the hour. Um, do you have time for one last question? Sure. Sorry to okay. babble on. Yeah. Oh, no. Hey, it's, it's very interesting. Um, this last question comes from Mike R. Uh, New, New York City has been shipping trash via barges and dumping it in the ocean. Is that happening in China? No. Um, I don't think it's happening much in China. What China, I mean, the, the Chinese waste problem is, is, you know, the city's it's stuff is going to, to landfills, but also a great deal to incinerators. The big problem in China and in many countries in Asia and Southeast Asia um, is the rural waste because there is no infrastructure for handling it because there is no garbage dump. Um, so, uh, or, you know, proper, proper landfill and proper collection. And so that stuff ends up in the ocean because it's, you know, if you're near a coast, it's so uncontrolled that it's getting into riverways and stuff and ending up getting dumped uh, into, the, into the environment. Um, but I don't think that they're, I, I've never heard of barges uh, taking waste out to dump it. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that that happens illegally sometimes, you know, just like there were all those waste dumps all around Beijing that somebody, you know, gets a contract with somebody who says, hey, pay me so much money, I'll make your garbage disappear. Um, and they do that, but it certainly is not something that, that's that's happening under under government control. Well, excellent. It's a fascinating topic. Um, interesting. Uh, and I want to thank you for uh, joining us tonight, Thanks Josh. Thanks for hanging in, people. About this. Um, and, and your book's available on Amazon? My book's available on Amazon. It's through UC Press, uh, Remains of the Everyday. If you're interested in this stuff, go please go ahead and read it. Otherwise, you know, there's there's plenty of interesting stuff uh, out there in the world to, to keep, uh, you know, if you're interested in the contemporary waste scene and the scrap scene, I'd go to Resource Recycling Online. Uh, they have a good... Uh, they cover the news on plastic and on and all kinds of, of waste uh, very well. And Waste Dive is another really good resource for people who, who for some reason, get into this topic. Um, and then if you're into discard studies as a concept, as the kind of more theoretical analytical tool, um, there is a site called Discard Studies, uh, one word where just brilliant work is actually being done, uh, run by this amazing person, Max Leguiron. Uh, they are 
brilliant, doing incredible research on plastic in the oceans uh, with, with a social justice model that's just, uh, um, just amazing. Well, great. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, Josh, and uh, thank you. have a good evening, everyone. Thanks again.